there's always, I think for many of us, there's that thought in the back of our heads where it's like, well, you know, auntie went to Las Vegas and she bought a better house or, right? I don't like that feeling. I don't want that thought in the back of our Kiki's mind. I want the thought like, okay, I can go away to the continent. I can learn how to become a doctor. I can also stay in Hawaii and become a doctor. And I will get the same level of lifestyle. I don't want, that's what I'm really fighting for. All right, welcome back to Hawaii Real, everybody. If you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Do you need an invitation? There's your invitation. Okay, click on that link below to subscribe and don't miss any of these episodes. Today with me, I have Patrick Bronco, former Kamehameha High School graduate. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to be in the State Department. Yep. And I mean, there's a whole story in between there. And now you're running for um, District 50, Kailua. Mm -hmm. Yep, House State House. So, State House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. How's that going for you? Um, I think it's going pretty well. We, we were able, we started early. I think that's one of the keys when you campaign. You need to start early and you need to get out there. And so I started back in December and I was able to get out there before COVID hit. And then that definitely changed the dynamics of the campaign. And for us, when, when COVID hit, we, with our campaign, we thought more of it as, uh, for me, I'm, I'm, this is my first time running for office, right? Mm -hmm. And so I need to show the community what I'm about. So for me, it was an opportunity to show with my prior training, being from the community, what can I do? What can I provide? And so for us, that was our, our thing. It was like, we're going to be doing resources. We're going to be reaching out to the community, those vulnerable populations that need assistance. We're going to make sure they get assistance and not do the hard campaign. Hi, I'm Pat Bronco. I want your vote. And also, will you write me a $50 check? You know? Oh, yeah. So, going for money. Yeah. But you got the name like Bronco. <laughs> Is anybody like brought that up at all? Absolutely. Well, it started, uh, there was this DEA director when I was in Embassy Bogota. And every time someone would say my name, he would just chuckle. And so I asked him, and this guy's like, probably like number three, like DEA office in Bogota, super high ranking position. And so I asked him like, hey, what's, what's up? Is it Mr. Bergman? And he's like, you have like a superhero name, like Pat Bronco, right? <laughs> you need like a, like a B on a cape. And so you would always laugh. Anybody ask you, like, are you from Denver? I do. I get that a lot. Um, also, when I'm campaigning, I am no longer Pat or Patrick. I am Bronco. Like, I'll knock on the door, like, Bronco! All right. Or, like, when I'm outside, like, walking on the street, people just, like, kind of shout my last name. It's, it's, it's interesting. It feels like, like I'm kind of like that high school jock a little bit, like, that goes by his, like, last name. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> like Flash. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Um... Did you get any flack for that in high school? Not at all. People always ask about like, cause like it's B-R-A-N-C-O. Uh -huh. And so actually my parents pronounce it Branco, but it's actually cause I'm a Spanish speaker. It's Branco um, in Portuguese actually. So, so it's a Portuguese name. It's a Portuguese last name. It actually means white. And that's actually a funny story cause oh. uh, my brother didn't know. I was like, Hey, do you know what our last name means? He's like, no, I'm like, it means white in Portuguese. And he's like, dude, our last name is Howley. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, it's, it's the color. It's the color, yeah. So, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Spanish is blanco. Si. Yeah. And Portuguese okay. is branco. Ah, those Portuguese. Yep. And English, it's a oh, badass horse. Right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So, uh, before we started uh, recording here, I was talking, hey, what are your hobbies? Do you surf or anything like that? Like, what do you, what do you like to do? Hobbies change when you're in campaign. So before campaign, definitely love to read a lot. Um, I'm an avid reader of like Hawaiian history. I always wanted to actually get my, my PhD in Hawaiian history. That was, that was my goal. I wanted to be a Hawaiian history teacher back in high school. Um, so reading, um, trying new restaurants. It really depends on where you are. Since I've lived all around the world, it kind of, the hobbies change, right? One of my favorite things to do is I love gardening which is the worst career to have as a U.S. diplomat because you're leaving every two years and you can't take your plans and you, you get connected to them. Yeah. Um, during campaign, just to help me de-stress, I walk. I walk a lot. I enjoy walking. Um, I, I don't live far from Kwai Nui Marsh. Mm -hmm. And so I walk the dike usually in the morning. I'm an early riser, so I wake up about 4.30. I'm out there about 5.30 and it's a good way. 
for me to connect just like with the Aina. And also my great grandparents' house is on the path there. So it's a way for me to also like just kind of reminisce about my great grandparents and feel connected to them. And it makes me sad because my family doesn't own that house anymore. But also the same way, it's my way to kind of honor and also just say aloha to my gra- great grandparents every time like I walk by that house. So, did you say you wake up at four thirty? Yes. What is wrong with you, man? It's, <laughs> it's natural. Well, I've always been an early riser because I yeah. come at mail, right? We woke up so early. Yeah. Like the Kailua bus left at six ten from Kailua Park. I came from Mililani, so yeah, mm-hmm. we were le- waking up really early, riding my bike to the bus stop just to get there and catch the bus into town. Oh, you rode the bike there? I rode my bicycle to the Blockbuster at Mililani um, Shopping Center. Not the town center, the smaller shopping center down low. And yeah, I had to ride my bicycle to catch the bus there, lock it up. Wow. And catch the Kamehameha bus from the shopping center to school. I would have to alternate because no one wanted to wake up. So like I would ask my grandma and then the next day I'd ask my grandpa and then ask my mom and then ask my dad. So everyone kind of rotated. Driving you to the bus stop? Yeah, driving me. Nice. Lucky. Yeah. <laughs> I had to ride my bike. Come rain or shine, man. I was riding my bike. It's, I was, think it was the worst after school because mm-hmm. the you know the day it's a long day and you get home from uh, the bu- the long bus ride out to Mililani, and um, yeah, I got to unlock my bike from the yeah. <laughs> from the rack and ride it all the way uphill back to my house. So it was like another half an hour just to get home. Yeah. Oh, trials and tribulations of. High school life. Yeah. I also remember too, like when if someone forgot to pick me up too, going, there was a pay phone and like, it's interesting because there's, I don't see pay phones at all. Mm-hmm. And like that pay phone was like a landmark in Kailua. Everyone knew it was by the light poles, by the, by the tennis courts and it's gone. But it's, it's interesting how like times have changed so much. Like I think about like how I like straddled in between. Like I was talking to someone yesterday when I first started at Kamehameha. I was writing, we didn't have a computer. So I was writing my papers on a typewriter and then like ninth grade came and then everyone switched to computers. And so this is a transition. Yeah. I used to have a typewriter. I remember uh, in the police department, yeah, we were doing all the reports either handwritten or via typewriter. And now you can't do that at all. Like mm-hmm. everything's digitized. So you have to know how to type. It doesn't matter if you have really good handwriting. Yep. Got to type. So, um, yeah, times have changed. So with the uh, times changing, how have you uh, implemented that with your campaign and stuff like that? Any technology or anything like social media? Social media has all, always been an important factor for our campaign. Um, for us, it was um, resources, right? And so my previous training, you quickly, for in a crisis management situation, you look for the population that is most vulnerable. And so immediately we knew it was going to be kupuna. They're going to need resources. And so what we did was we made these kupuna kits, which was a can of soup, um disposable gloves applesauce tea just a bunch of mishma- uh, mishmash well, like whatever we had or whatnot and so we put it out on social media just me and my family like super like local hawaii style luau table in the garage just stuffing these these bags and we put it out there on social media and we got like fifty five thousand views on this video and we were able to deliver um over 350 kapuna kits into the community and so anyone who asked one got it we tried to do windward oahu specific um, just because, you know, I don't want to drive around so much. Um, but if anyone wanted, I, I went all the way as far as Kapole to deliver some of them. And so that was important. So we did that for a month. Once that trickled off, um, one day my grandma was like, boy, you should put on a mask. Yeah. And I was like, grandma, I don't have a mask, right? It was just like that period where people didn't know where to get it. And so my grandma like went on YouTube and Googled and she actually started sewing masks. And so now that's another component of our campaign. Um, if anyone wants a mask, they get a mask and we've delivered over 3,500 into the community. And so, yeah, same thing, two luau tables now. Um, I cut fabric, I don't sew, but I can cut fabric. My aunt pins and then my grandma sews and we knock it out. And so when we do do phone calls into the community, we ask, hey, how are you? Do you need a mask? Then I quickly, that next day I'll send it out, so. Freaking nice, man. That's awesome. So not only are you putting your word out on social media and getting your name out, the Bronco name, um, but you're providing great service to uh, your community. And that's what we like to see. That's the kind of thing yeah. that uh, we need from our candidates and politicians and stuff these days, right? Yeah. Someone told me, I forget who early on, they're like, people want to see you work for it. Yeah. Right? And so it's important to work for it and be consistent. So we, when we can sign wave, we're consistently out there. We're trying to offer resources. Um, people are shocked that I actually call them back or I give a, 
on my my flyers I sent out, personal my personal cell phone. People can reach me easily and I respond. And I think that's super important. My team does say like, um, if if I can't respond or like I'll be like, hey, I responded, please. I have this like 24 hour, please respond within 24 hours. And they're like, the norm here in Hawaii is 72 hours. I'm like in the State Department, we had to respond within 15 seconds. When I was, I worked in the operations center for for the Secretary of State. Someone literally was behind us with a timer. If an email hit the mailbox, we had to respond within 15 seconds. No way. Yeah. Well, how do you do that if you get like multiple emails? So there's six of us. It's kind of like the movies, actually. So like six of us that sit in a circle, and then we all have access to the same mailbox. Okay. It's kind of like the movies, like where it's like four screens, and there's screens everywhere, and clocks and whatnot. And so literally, you would sit there, and there was like you had a sequence. So if you were the first officer, you would have to respond, and then it would go down. And so you would respond. And then you're all talking loud. You have earphones. It's actually kind of crazy um, being there. And like you had to be like, email in. Currently on a call with the secretary. Watch officer. Can you take this? And you have to like direct and like do the traffic. So it was so like, like a traffic control tower or at yeah, the airport yeah. kind of things. <laughs> Everyone had a specific set of duties. There was a sequence. Like if the first officer couldn't do it, then the next one did it. But everyone had their like their seats and their their roles. It was an intensive training program. It was like probably I want to say like three months that you had someone standing behind you directing you. Click this. Do this say this, this is the phrasing we use. This is the voice you use. So so what kind of emails or calls are coming in that you're taking care of uh, doing that kind of thing? It's going to be everything from a constituent email like, hey, I'm in Mexico, I've lost my visa, to, hi, I'm Mike Pompeo, please uh, please do XXX. You know, I can't, I can't go into detail right. and certain things, but yeah. So our role in the operations center, we're, we're basically the state, the White House situation room equivalent. And so that's what we were doing there and um, we were responding to any requests that we had from the highest ups in State Department as well as across the federal government. Okay, so is, is any like a Tom Clancy and Jack Ryan stuff like legit or is that, no, it's all fiction. <laughs> so I've never seen the Jack Ryan thing, the Venezuela episode. Come on, but man. But people always ask me and I've heard some comments that are saying like, that is not how our diplomatic plates actually look or... Um, I watch Madam Secretary sometimes too, mm -hmm. just to hate watch it because I'm just like, our offices are not that nice. And why do you make all the foreign service, like career people look bad? Like we're inadequate and you, the political appointees are, are like the shining beacon. Like, nope, we're the ones who actually do all the work people. And so, yeah, it's, well, it's been interesting watching it, that show. It's like any of those shows, like CSI, you know, a mm -hmm. police officer or a scientist or anybody watching CSI or Hawaii Five O. it's like, that's complete bogus, mm -hmm. man. It does, it's not like that at all. Yeah. Everyone in the, in, the, in the continent would always be like, have you seen Hawaii Five O? I'm like, nope, and proud of it. <laughs> yeah, I think I watched a few episodes and then it was just like, oh, okay, entertainment value just, eh, just kind of diminished on me. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. eh. I was actually in a couple of those episodes as an extra, though. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. Didn't see my face, though. <laughs> but it was fun working on those sets. Is it true that if you have a speaking role, then you get on the credits? I believe so. And also, if you're a speaking role, you get like a little trailer um, changing room with its own little bathroom and stuff like that. Wow. it's impressive. And if you're on set, everybody gets fed. Wow. And not just like a little play lunch thing, but mm -hmm. they have like... A legit layout of food and nice. stuff. So it's pretty cool. I had a friend, um, another diplomat, he posted in Mexico and he actually was an extra, it was like a doorman in this like box office top Mexican movie. It was funny because he had to get like clearances upon clearances just to be in this, in this movie. So Johns Hopkins. Yeah. So you got into Johns Hopkins out of, so you went to Hawaii Baptist. Hawaii Pacific. Hawaii Pacific. Sorry. Hawaii Pacific University, mm -hmm. and then went to John Hopkins. Yeah, so at Hawaii Pacific, um, entered in as a business major, started with accounting. My two columns would never match up. Yeah, that sounds super exciting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, no. And it was funny, too, because all my friends are in the class, and the professor liked me. He's like, you're getting a B plus. Like, why are you dropping out? Because it was like a month before the class ed ended. I was like, no, nope, not for me. And so I love history. But I needed something a little bit more practical. And so I became an international relations major because it like you learn economy, you learn history, you learn business, you learn trade, commerce, and it kind of just fit me. 
And so I did international relations undergrad, um, studied abroad in South Korea, got this really cool scholarship where I did one semester at a university there, Sogong University, right in the heart of Seoul. And then in the summer, I got to um, work at LG Electronics in the Legal Foreign Affairs Division, which was an amazing experience. Um, I also kind of was like starting the pathway where I thought I was going to be a lawyer. And so it was really good for me to to learn about that. And it was this was like just another like notch in my belt, like, okay, worked in a legal counsel office, uh, maybe not my thing. And so that went on, graduated, graduated 2009. Oh, let me re rewind back. Uh, 2008, I received, uh, I had this awesome professor, Dr. Juarez, who just amazing. He sent me this opportunity. Um, there's this critical language scholarship from State Department. A lot of people don't know this, that the State Department's encouraging um, U.S. citizens to learn critical languages across the world. So it could be Mandarin, Korean, Farsi, um, Azerbaijani, anything. And you apply, you get the scholarship. They send you for a summer that you study the language, no commitment, you come back. Yeah, so uh, my junior year, I received a critical language scholarship from the State Department to study Korean in in Seoul. And so I went there and in orientation, I remember they were like, if you like studying languages, you should consider applying for the Charles B. Rangel International Affairs Fellowship. And I remember that. So came back to Hawaii, graduated 2009, and then um, financial crisis, right? What am I going to do? Luckily, I had a job. I was working at a, a big litigation law firm here in Hawaii as a paralegal. Again, another knock notch in my belt. Law, probably not not the best suit for me. All the attorneys, when I when I talked about like being abroad, they're like, go and do that. And so studied, applied for the Rango International Affairs Fellowship, as well as for Johns Hopkins and a bunch of other schools. And I received the Rangel International Affairs Fellowship. And so let me talk about Charles Rangel a little bit. Congressman Rangel, African-American, um, Puerto Rican congressman from New York, long time um, congressman. He would travel all around the world and they always thought he was the driver. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And so what he realized was the face of American diplomacy abroad wasn't reflective of the diversity of America. So he created this program that recruited 20 students across the country and basically we joined a diplomat pipeline program. They, um, the diversity was, um, state department, traditionally male, pale, stale, and Yale. Wow. Yeah. That's, a, that's what we <laughs> call it. One. Right. <laughs> and so that the goal was to, to, to change that. Mm. And so I got recruited. I was the first from Hawaii to receive this fellowship, an amazing honor. Um, and then I got into Johns Hopkins, the fellowship reached out to Johns Hopkins. Um, the fellowship covered my education at Johns Hopkins. And also set me up with all my internships as well. And then also mentors and then into the foreign service. So first summer, again, um, you know, my heart is Hawaii. My, my issue is Korea issues. So I go to Congressman Faleo Mavaenga's office from American Samoa, which was awesome. Loved the guy, but he would always call me Malahini. And I was like, I'm not a tourist. <laughs> like, you would always joke with me. Um, but to be on the hill, right? I'm 23 years old on the hill. An amazing opportunity for me. Next summer, um, I go to Embassy Seoul. So you could pick any embassy in the world that was safe to go. And so I was like, oh, maybe I'll go to Mongolia or maybe I'll go to Thailand. And my director, brilliant woman, um, was like, you have a Korean language exam coming up before you graduate. You're going to Korea. And so I ended up going back to Seoul. Um, at the time, I was coned to be an economics officer. So Johns Hopkins, I'm studying international economics, Korea studies. I'm going to be an economic officer reporting on economic issues in the State Department. That's kind of my pathway. Um, but I feel like my personality is a little bit more bubbly. I like engaging with people. So I ask, can I intern in the public diplomacy section of the, of the embassy? And so I go there, loved it. Um, I was with like the regional officer that we traveled around the outskirts of Seoul and of, of the country and shared um, American culture, English language learning, sports diplomacy. And I loved it. It was an amazing summer. And so I go back to Hopkins, study there, which is an amazing school. And I can explain a little bit more about Johns Hopkins. So Johns Wait, mm -hmm. Are you a lacrosse fan? I am never played. I've never thought about it. Johns Hopkins is great lacrosse. Right? School, it's right? like the Blue Jays, right? Or yeah. something. 
So this is the other thing that's unique about the, the master's program I went to. Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS, is a super elite, super small school that's actually in Washington, D.C. and separated away from Baltimore. And so we really don't have any relationship with the mother campus. Oh, okay. So didn't get into lacrosse, but it's amazing. Like you, you go, you're there and you are with like the brightest minds from around the world. And like you literally walk into the courtyard and there's a piece of the Berlin wall, like in the courtyard. Um, the school did have the kind of the start of the neocon kind of philosophy. Um, Paul Wolfowitz was a dean there, um, a big neocon. Um, kind of the, those were the ones under the Bush administration, the second Bush administration who kind of developed some ideas that, you know, America is the greatest force around the world and we should conquer in any way. Don't agree with that, but, um, they really, the school really teaches international relations and diplomacy through the lens of economics. So everyone there has to do intensive micro and macro economics courses. And it was intense. Like even though I had a background in economics, this was like next level, like corporate finance sheets and analyzing the economy. Um, but it was a great opportunity for me. Learned a lot, made a lot of friends and also still in the diplomat pipeline program. So Oh, the other great thing about the Wrangle program is they hook you up with uh, mentors. So my mentor, cause you still have to pass the foreign service exam to get in. And so my mentor was the former ambassador to Brunei and she would just drill me and prepare me for this examination. And so, um, graduated, passed the foreign service exam, went into the foreign service. And then that's where my, um, my, my foreign service career started. So I think you probably have some questions or want to dive into to something. So where do we start? Yeah. I mean, I like to ask questions based on like what my listeners might want to know. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a lot. That was a lot. It was a lot. However, um, since you're running for uh, office here in Hawaii, that's like such a fantastic and deep background. And you've traveled all over the world. You've worked in Seoul. You've worked in Colombia. Where else? Um, in Caracas, Venezuela, Islamabad, Pakistan, and some short stints in Kabul, Afghanistan. Right, right, right. So you hear um, people locally, eh, not locally here so much, but um, on the news media, you know, people hating America and saying that, you know, um, things, are, things are trash here, things are bad here. But, you know, I, I've lived in the Philippines, in Manila, and... No, things there are bad. Mm -hmm. Like we don't realize Americans who haven't traveled abroad don't realize how bad things can get and things are in other countries. You know, do you have any experience with that? It's hard because for me, I guess when I, when I traveled abroad for me, I've loved every post. I've loved every, every post has something unique for me. Um, so in Colombia, to me, it was amazing that a country that had over 50 years of internal strife. The people were so kind, so hopeful, and just so kind to me. And they love Hawaii, by the way. Well, generally around the world, everyone loves Hawaii. My strategy when I was in the foreign service, like, um, where are you from? And I'd be like, from Hawaii. And then, so immediately you just see their eyes bright up. Um, I had a cool story when I was in Colombia. I sat next to, I think she was the Colombian ambassador to South Africa. And she's like, where are you from? I'm like, Hawaii. And she's like, do you know Ho'oponopono? And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, there's like this author here in Latin America that like writes about the Ho'oponopono methodology. And it's actually quite prolific um, throughout Latin America. And so it was amazing to see how our culture um, actually permeates around the world. And so it's very interesting. What is that about? Uh, Ho'oponopono? Uh, in Latin America. Yeah. Oh, in Latin America. Um, I guess it's just a, another form of conflict resolution. And there's also like very strong indigenous roots in Latin America, especially in Peru throughout. And so there are some synergies um, between our culture as well as the indigenous cultures in Latin America. Which brings me back to lacrosse. Like that's <laughs> yeah. a total indigenous Native American sport. That's why I love it because we're bringing it here uh, to Hawaii and um, I'm part of the league here. And oh, nice. they, have a, they have a good club in one word side. So shout out to, you know, Hawaii lacrosse. But yeah, no, um, like Hawaiian history, you said you were a, you know, a lover of Hawaiian history. Yeah. Um, I, Hawaiians made it to South America and back, <laughs> right? Uh, we have the sweet potato. <laughs> I, I don't know about that, but yeah, Hawaiian history was something, something that was very, 
just as a, as a kid, I went to a small private school, and like, I I I talked to Doctor Chun about this, um, former headmaster of Kumeme schools, and for many of us Kanaka families, our household culture is local. It's not necessarily Hawaiian. Correct. And so when we go to Kamehameha or immersion programs or whatnot, it kind of is an opening of our eyes for us who don't really understand our our history. And for me, I went to a small private school in Kailua where I didn't really know about my history. I just kind of assumed I'm another local guy, kind of, you know, from Kailua, Kailua boy. But I, when I went to Kamehameha, it opened my eyes to this whole history. And I just... I love it because I feel like it's not just learning about history. There's some type of connection for me. There's it's it's my people. It's my history. It's it's more powerful than that. And so for me, it's like reading family stories. That's what I love about Hawaiian history. What do you love about Hawaii? You've been around the world. You've seen a lot. Everything. <laughs> I, there's there's a vibe in Hawaii that you cannot replicate anywhere else in the world. Um, we are a multi pot, a, a melting pot society. And there's this feeling here that you cannot, and it's a feeling you get as soon as you walk off the plane and you just feel it. And maybe it's, it's uh, the gas fumes mixed with the smell of picake or, or plumeria or whatever, but there's a feeling here that you cannot replicate anywhere else in the world. And that's why I'm connected to this place. That's why I came back to this place. And that's why I'm, I'm always, this is, this is why I'm here because that's, that's Hawaii and that will all forever be a part of me. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope, sorry. I, I feel like I'm getting into some like extra, like some tangent, but I, that's the thing for Hawaii and the food, the food, the food's great, the beach. Um, you really do realize when you live on the continent or elsewhere, how much it affects you when you don't have that drive where you kind of in your periphery vision have the ocean yeah. or these beautiful mountains. It's lived, not always the case. Yeah, I lived five years in Las Vegas and it's just brown mountains any, way, any which way you turn. Sand in your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> and just for me, it was um, missing the emerald colored mountains because mm -hmm. over there, you know, all the mountains are brown and in the winter, yeah, Mount Charleston has a uh, snow caps and stuff like that, but... You, you can't make a determination of Malco or Makai over there. Yeah. Like sometimes you don't even know if you're going north, south, east, or west because you're surrounded by these mountains. Yeah. Um, Let me get a little bit more specific to another reason why I love Hawaii is I love no matter where you go, that feeling you get when you run into a dear friend or an auntie or uncle or you make a connection with someone like, oh, yeah, yeah. oh you related to that person, right? That is for me is so powerful. I love that. Like some of my best interactions is when you're in like Taniokas and you go in and you see someone, oh, you're like, oh, it's my classmate's husband, right? And you make that connection. I love that. And that's, that's why I love Hawaii is that feeling, that feeling you get where it's a sense of familiarity, a sense of aloha, a sense of love, and a sense of knowing your place. So I'm sorry, when I think about, um, candidates running for office, one of the things that pops into my mind is that the main reason someone runs for office is because they're dissatisfied. Yes, they want to do public service, and there's probably you know a number of other issues that they want to um, touch on when they're running for office, but main, namely that they're dissatisfied with how things are, and they want to go in there and do a better job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there anything you're dissatisfied with that um, either locally Kailua or City County Honolulu, Island of Oahu, or the state of Hawaii? that um, you've, you've seen that you can want to go there and touch on and yeah. improve? My, my wheelhouse is economics, right? And so maybe not a dissatisfaction, but an observation. Hawaii needs to diversify. We've been talking about it for so long, but why haven't we been able to do this, right? I've, one of my favorite books is The Price of Paradise by Randall Roth. Great read. Um, and we've talked about it since then. The book is, I think, is written in the 90s. We talk about this. Even Governor Burns was saying this. Governor Ariyoshi has spoken about this. Why can't we do it? And why can't we do it successful? And that's one of the reasons I'm running for office is I have a dream of diversifying Hawaii's economy, building a vibrant economy where local students or our kids can grow up thinking, okay, I can go study on the mainland. Um, but the idea here is, okay, I can go to the continent. I can learn. 
but I can come back, right? I don't want them to think, do I need to go to the continent? Because if I stay here, I have to live with grandma. Or if I go there, I can have a house, right? I want the decision to be like, well, I can go to the continent to learn. I can stay here and learn. I want there to be more fluid options. That's something I really, really want to do. So you want to make it a place for people to come back to. Go yes. away, feel safe going away to college and learning, and then feel comfortable coming back to mm -hmm. Hawaii. Or also just staying too, right? And just having that not, there's always, I think for many of us, there's that thought in the back of our heads where it's like, well, you know, auntie went to Las Vegas and she bought a better house or, right? I don't like that feeling. I don't want that thought in the back of our Keiki's mind. I want the thought like, okay, I can go away to the continent. I can learn how to become a doctor. I can also stay in Hawaii and become a doctor. And I will get the same level of lifestyle. I don't want, that's what I'm really fighting for. And that's what I want to do. That's a big fight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know. I, I'm Pat Bronco, you know, superhero with a superhero name. If it was easy, you wouldn't be doing it. Exactly. Doing it because it's hard. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, because that's definitely um, that's definitely some that's a big big issue. Um, for me personally, I see my kids like they might not stay here in Hawaii when they're when they're an adult, just because of the skyrocketing prices of mm -hmm. housing and stuff like that. Um, I don't know what they're gonna do. Um, as they get older, the, you know, the world is their oyster, as we say. Um, so they could live in the mainland and I'd be okay with that too. Um, but yeah, it would be great to have them be able to go away, learn, mm -hmm. learn about living in other places, learn about solving problems in other ways, mm -hmm. and then bring that knowledge back to Hawaii. Yeah. I'm the oldest. Um, I have eight younger cousins. We all grew up together, same house. We have this big house and we all live together. Um, I always tell my cousins, when you go to college, what I want you to do is to study abroad. And I want you to study abroad in a country you do not know the language. Because you learn life skills when you are trying to catch a metro and you have 15 minutes to get to work and you don't understand what they're saying. You have 15 minutes or not even a time. How are you buying food when you're hungry in a country that you do not know the language? It teaches you something. It teaches you. And I think our elite knew that. Right. And that's the other reason I love it kind of for Hawaiian history. It all kind of com combines for me is that our Ali'i traveled the world. They saw what was out there, but they always brought it back and they applied it to Hawaii and they made it uniquely Hawaiian as well. And that's what's so important to me. And I think that's why I love Hawaiian history because it combines all the different facets of my life in a way. And it makes me feel connected. Like does Kailua, is Kailua set and like doesn't want a whole lot of change or do they want like things to come in and get fixed and change? Or are they just kind of cool with how things are and just keep things status quo? There's been a lot of change in Kailua. Um, you know, there's been the development. More tourists are coming in. Um, it's definitely changed. That has definitely upset a lot of people in our community. Um, Kailua was a solid, and still is to some extent, a solid working class district. Um, the history in Kailua, a lot of firemen, a lot of police officers, a lot of working class families moved to Kailua because you could buy a house with only $500 down. And that was, that was reasonable. And, but you know, with what's going on now with the change, um, people want change, people want change, but people want to be able to have input in the change. And I think that's where the friction is coming in Kailua is that our town, our community is changing without our input, the community's input. And that's one of the reasons I'm running as well as I come from, I'm a fourth generation Kailua resident, right? My family has been there for a while. We've seen the changes. Um, and that's why I'm running is to make sure that community input is always there and is the guiding compass when it comes to decision-making for, for our community. Yeah. One of my buddies, uh, I had on an earlier podcast, uh, he runs Kalapa White Cafe. Oh, nice. Yeah, and he was saying that yeah, if as a business owner there, you have you're answerable to your community and your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Like if they want you to cut your bushes outside or trim your trees outside, you have to really ask yourself why are they like pinpointing that particular thing? It could be because you know when they're driving along, they can't see somebody coming off the sidewalk or on the crosswalk or something. Um, so you know, as a business owner in Kailua, you have to really um, cater to you know your neighbors and your community. Just so they are number one, they're your customers a lot of the time. So, well, also like Kailua, like we're a very 
Um, our electorate in Kailua is a very aware, a very involved population. Our neighborhood board is also very involved as well. Um, and it's also historical. It's geographical, right? Kailua, Kauai Nui Marsh, that area was a breadbasket for Oahu during ancient Hawaiian times, right? And so it makes sense that now Kailua is a prime spot. And so there is that tension between development and um, keeping things residential or keeping things all the way it is. And it makes sense because Kailua is a prime geographical spot on Oahu. So how do we make that balance, right? And for me, I always feel the balance is struck for, from those who live in the community. And when the community decides, that's the most important. And so my role, I believe, as if I do get elected as the next legislator, is to make sure the community voice is heard, but also to give the information, the resources, that our community can make the best decisions for their lives. What is your philosophy on life? Mm. Aloha first. Always aloha first. Um, there, was a, there was a boy at school, I remember, punched me, made me very upset, came home. Mom, this boy, da 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 I even forget his name. He punched me. And she was, you know, I'll give him aloha, show him aloha, love him. And then he became my best friend. Um, eventually well, it was childhood times you know your best friend changes it i was like oh he's my best friend but i can't even remember his name now <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah aloha first um always show uh treat people with respect always listen i think that's the other big philosophy when we is listening a lot of politicians do not listen and I, i'm very proud that in my community people um like i'll hear like through the grapevine they're like oh yeah yeah you wouldn't stop at auntie's house she said, yeah, I'm voting for you because you're the first politician that actually listens. And so that's my style. I just listen. And that's what I did in the foreign service was listening to both sides because you need to listen first to understand the context. There's too many people who come in guns blazing. We're doing this without understanding, without listening and understanding a community context. And I think that's what's important. And so that's kind of my philosophy in life is aloha first, always treat people with respect. For me also, I do believe it's a game of, not a game, I wanna say, for me, my life is is addition, it's not subtraction. I want to add people to my life. I want to add aloha to my life. I wanna add something to my life, right? As well as I can add to other people's lives. And so for me, I'm not looking at making less friends, I'm looking at making more friends, building more partners, building more collaboration. And so that's kind of my viewpoint and how I, I view, um, view issues, view my life, view anything that's going forward. That's beautiful. Like addition and not subtraction like that, that anybody could take that into their life, you know, philosophy. And that's a great one. Mm -hmm. I like that. It's the first one I've first time I heard that. <laughs> so, uh, bringing Aloha, did you bring Aloha to, um, the world in the different places that you went to? Absolutely. Did you see that return to you from the locals over there? I would say yes. I felt in every country, I had a lot of friends, a lot of working partners, a lot of great working relationships that I actually keep in touch. Um, one of my partners that I worked with in, in Pakistan, um, this medical office um, that gave vaccinations, I actually spoke to them, the family last week that runs this uh, maybe 80 year old um, family hospital in Islamabad. Um, actually, Two days ago, I spoke to my former assistant in Colombia. I felt like that was the approach, like give aloha, lots of macadamia nuts with <laughs> um, chocolate. Uh, the biggest, just a side note, I always brought Big Island cookies, shortbread chocolate dip. Immediately, any office when I first started, I brought two of those, put it out, and like it just won people over immediately. And I still get like requests for those around the world. I'm like, I would send it to you, but shipping is so expensive. Um, but yeah, um, I do remember another, um, experience when I was flying into Afghanistan the first time commercial sat next to, um, an Afghan and he asked me where I was from and I said, Hawaii, and he, he didn't know Hawaii. So I told him a little bit and he's like, do you know Afghanistan and the beauty of Afghanistan? And I was like, no, not really. And so he's like, let me look, show you out the window. And so we're going through Afghanistan flying over and it's all snow capped mountain. And he's pointing out the various mountains to me. He um like even bought me a soda too. And that's like in your mindset when you think of Afghanistan, you think of like a war torn, you know, a hostile country. And no, that's not the case. In Afghanistan, I felt so, so I met some of the most hospitable people. 
And I feel very fortunate to have that. And it actually changed my, my, my point of view or the way I, I approach issues, right? I was speaking earlier about um, understanding context, listening, observing before you take action. So I want to ask you this, um, mm-hmm. one of the last questions here. Um, when you were at all these other places, right, did they think that you were local? Oh, absolutely. Like when you're in Colombia, they thought you're Colombia. Colombian, Venezuelan, they thought you're Venezuelan. Yep. Because yeah. you, could, you could pass for any of that. You could, mm-hmm. you could be in Pakistan and pass for a Pakistani maybe. Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, there's uh, in, in Pakistan, they're in the northern part with borders um, Afghanistan, there's more, they're fairer people. And so they have dark features and that, that's me, right? Um, but yeah, I was the international chameleon. And people said that was like kind of my <laughs> diplomacy superpower was I easily blended in everywhere, right? And so that was something. And I, when I talked to students about like a career in diplomacy, I just spoke to a student um, at Kamehameha who was interested in diplomacy. That's a competitive advantage we have here as living in Hawaii is we've lived around so many different cultures. We've interacted with so many different cultures. It makes us natural born diplomats. And so I always say like, please consider a career in becoming a diplomat or in international relations, anything. My cousin works for um, the International Office of Migration. Um, basically, they help all the refugees worldwide. They're, they're funded by the UN, and she has a diplomatic status as well. But she also, like, born diplomat because of our local upbringing. And so you can work for USAID doing development work. You work for international business. We have skills here in Hawaii that we don't know that we are this innately born with and we grew up with and are refined over time. And so that's one of the other things I always tell students is study abroad, go abroad, but bring it back home and make sure that you're always giving back to your home. Yeah. To touch on that, like one of the things that I learned, um, as a police officer, uh, here in Kalihi is that you deal with so many different, uh, ethnicities and cultures all in the same neighborhood, mm-hmm. you know, and you couldn't get that in a lot of con- in a lot of uh, counties or cities across the country. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd probably just have a predominantly white neighborhood or predominantly black neighborhood, or this would be the Asian or Korean mm-hmm. neighborhood. You know, here you'd have like one house has Vietnamese, one house has Filipino, one house has uh, uh, Micronesian, one house has Samoan. Like mm-hmm. in in the span of one day, you could deal with a number of different cultures and different peoples, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all of whom like speak English as a second language. Yeah. You know, so it. I think you're right. I think if you, as a Hawaii resident, if you could definitely put yourself out there and touch on all these different cultures, it does make you naturally diverse Mm -hmm. already because you're just, you you start to get that um, working knowledge of all these other cultures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't have that across country. Yeah. Patrick, it's been awesome. You have any uh, last words? Um, No, just this is a real pleasure. Thank you so much for, for this opportunity. Um, and I hope we can talk again. Maybe we can do something in the future, more perspectives or something, but thank you very much. It was great to meet you and great to speak with you. Thank you. Stay happy, Hoy.